Great to be with you, Sid Light Plimpton. Um, we're going to read the Bible together, so if you've got one with you, please open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 from verse 18. And I'm reading from the ESV. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? But since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers, Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, that the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. And this is God's word. So you're going through a series through the book of 1 Corinthians. Looking at Paul's, this is one of the earliest letters uh, that we have a record of, um, written about 30 or so years Uh, after Jesus' death. And so it was written at a time when people could verify uh, the great news about Jesus, uh, his life, death and resurrection. People had seen him risen from the dead. And so he wrote a letter which went out publicly. It was written to the people in Corinth, but it was spread around and abroad after that. And people could verify that the same Jesus that Paul was speaking of, others had seen too. And this movement of Christians was spreading around the world. This movement of Christians who held to be the most important thing in the world, the most life-changing thing in the world, that Jesus is the only Son of God. He died for the forgiveness of sins and He bodily rose from the dead and has ascended into heaven. This news is what got into the hearts of the people at Corinth with the church that Paul planted there. And it changed them. And so he's following up with this letter. And last week you would have seen uh, that he was, uh, I guess, introducing himself again to the church, reminding them of the gospel that he'd preached, reminding them that it's not about who the preacher is. It's not about particular personalities because that didn't save you. That didn't change your life. It was Jesus and the good news about him, the word of the cross as we see in verse 18. It's the word of the cross that changed people's lives, that got into their hearts, that made them give up on everything else they were living for and live a totally different way. And Paul's speaking about this because this is what happened to him. If you read through the book of Acts, you'll see that Paul was actually an anti-Christian. He was putting Christians to death because he believed that was the most faithful thing to do to God. So he was completely convinced that he was right and he was completely doing the wrong thing. Now, that's often the position of people's hearts today. We are absolutely convinced that the way that we're living, the things that we're doing are right. Or we're in a position where we're wrestling with the things that we're doing and the ways that we're living. But the way that God met Paul and the overflow that's in this letter is that Jesus changes people's lives. There's really two ways to live. You can either boast in yourself and 
how good you are towards other people or be filled with a sense of, I haven't, I've missed the mark. I haven't lived up to the expectations of others. I haven't lived up to the expectations of my parents or my family or my peers. Or you can boast in what God has done for you and live under his rule and reign. And that's what Paul is going to speak into for us today. And he's going to do that by giving us a great term for the gospel, which is the word of the cross. So we're going to look at that together this morning. So as we consider this word of the cross, the first thing we see in our text is that the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. That is the Christian message that Jesus has died for the forgiveness of sins. That this same Jesus who lived, died and rose again, that his, his word, this word of the cross is folly to a perishing world. I mean, we'd know that to be true. Many of us who are out in the workplace, in our families, in our places of education, know that people think Christians are a little bit ridiculous. That the Christian belief is taking things a bit too seriously. Now, this world thinks that you are foolish if you don't just hold Christian values, but you really believe in Jesus. You have a personal relationship with him. And Paul is quick to acknowledge that. Why? Well, we see that the word of the cross is folly because it inverts worldly powers. Have a look with me. He's quoting from Isaiah in verse 19. It says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and, I'll, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. This word of the cross, this message about Jesus has such a power to it that it undoes worldly wisdom, that it undoes people who think they're smart end up looking foolish. It's as if the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning is in inverted commas. With all our wisdom and discernment in the world, we're neither happy nor satisfied. The things we strive after, the more we cling to, the things that we're looking for, the less we have them. Yet by something so foolish as the word of the cross, this message that Jesus lived, died and rose again for you and I personally, by that message, people are genuinely saved and transformed. Let me give you an example. I had a friend who became a Christian last year. Very successful uh, man. He works in, in, as an executive. Pretty much had everything he ever wanted. You know, settled down, two kids, beautiful house in the Adelaide Hills, best place to live. And uh, you know, great job, lots of like, great income, plenty of social status, uh, you know, had a vineyard, really... Everything that you could possibly want, he had it. But internally, he felt utterly empty and unsatisfied. He had this sense that there was more to life and perhaps Christianity had some answers. And so he began to dig into the Christian faith, began to read the Bible. In fact, he said to me, he began to study the Ten Commandments. And he said, I really looked at them. I didn't just, you know, glance over and said, yep, tick, I haven't murdered someone. Tick, I haven't committed adultery. Tick, you know, I don't have any gods, like idols, other gods set up in my home. But then he really began to look at those things, the way that Jesus interprets them in the Sermon on the Mount. And he realised, you know, if there's one thing I can't escape from, it's my own sin. You know, he'd lived his whole life being able to, like, been successful at pretty much everything he set his mind to. But if there's one thing he couldn't do, it was escape his own sin. He just realised through deep Bible study and reflection on God's word, he couldn't get away from his own sin. And so that brought him, he said, to surrender himself to Jesus because he realised that Jesus was the only way that he could be forgiven from his sin. And that word of the cross got into his heart. Later, uh, we were talking, this is only a few weeks ago, uh, and he said to me, he said, I've got the most important moment in my life coming up. And I said, oh, you know, like compared to, you know, um, 
getting married or the, the birth of a child. I know this is the most important moment in my life is baptism. And I thought, wow, he gets it. Because the word of the cross, which was foolishness to him before, has now become wisdom. Because everything he was searching for, he couldn't find. The more he tried to grab hold of it, the more it slipped through his fingers. And that is the truth for you and I. When you pursue happiness, you won't find it. When you pursue sexual satisfaction, you will not find it. When you pursue wealth, you will always be looking for a little bit more. When you uh, pursue security, whether it's, you know, the house, the superannuation, you know, the investments, whatever it is, it will never be enough. But when you throw yourself in with the foolishness of the cross and and the word of the cross gets deep into your heart, you'll find it's enough. Just like he did. So the word of the cross is folly, but it inverts worldly powers. It also makes us trip over our own demands. We see a little bit later in our text from verse 22, it says, For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. Now this is interesting in the context of uh, the time that 1 Corinthians was written. Jews Uh, by virtue of being a God-believing people, believed that God had acted in history. And so when they read the Old Testament, they remembered the signs of God. And so they were looking for signs. They're people who expect that God moves in power and does things, except they hadn't seen anything since Jesus' ministry. And Jesus' ministry was very upsetting for Jewish people because he looked like God, except he broke their paradigm for who God is because God cannot be a man according to their beliefs. Interestingly, the Greeks demanded wisdom. Just before uh, the era that we're in, in 1 Corinthians, when the Romans were ruling over the world, the Greeks had ruled over the Mediterranean region uh, through the conquering of Alexander the Great. And so their culture had become preeminent. The, the, language, the Greek language was the common language of the day, a bit like the English language in the West. And yet now the Greeks had lost preeminence. So, so though they were demanding signs and though they were demanding wisdom, they didn't have it, they couldn't find it. And then comes the word of the cross. You see, the word of the cross, or as it's put in verse 23, Christ crucified, becomes something that makes people stumble over it. Because for Jews, God cannot become a man. Because he's one God, and God certainly wouldn't die in shame on a cross because he's all-powerful. For Greeks... Well, why should there only be one God? Why not many? Why aren't there many ways to get to God? And how can one God answer all the philosophical and existential problems of humanity like, you know, why are we here and what do we live for? But God doesn't give them a direct answer to these signs that they're looking for or this wisdom perhaps they're looking for. He gives them the word of the cross. He gives them Christ crucified. You know, perhaps you're looking for a sign from God this morning. Perhaps you've prayed, God, I need a sign from you today because I'm struggling or I don't know what direction my life is going in. And so I need a sign from you today. And yet God has given you the word of the cross. Perhaps you're looking for a better philosophical arguments to your existential crises. I find when you get to your late 30s, which I'm getting to now, you begin to have existential problems. What am I living for? And what is life all about? And have I met the expectations of my younger self? But God doesn't give me necessarily those answers. He gives me Christ crucified. Now how... Do those things work their way deep into our hearts? Well, I think Paul's conversion is a good example. See, Paul writes this letter as an overflow 
of what Jesus has done for him. You see, Paul thought he was wise. He studied under the preeminent Pharisee, Gamaliel. He was a rising star in religious leadership and had much to boast about. But when he met Jesus, or better put, when Jesus met him on the road to Damascus, it all changed. He thought he knew the right way, but when Jesus met him, the word of the cross became everything to him. We learn in the book of Philippians, so much so that he considered everything he knew before to be rubbish. Every qualification he had before to be rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of Jesus. I don't know uh, where you're at this morning with how you think about the Christian faith, whether you think it's a little bit foolish, whether you think it doesn't have all the answers, whether you're hoping it has more answers for you. But Paul would say to you, and the Holy Spirit would say to you this morning, that the word of the cross is really what you need and it will satisfy you in a place deep in your heart that perhaps you haven't realised before. So firstly, the word of the cross is folly to a perishing world. It does invert worldly powers. It makes us trip over our own demands. But the word of the cross, secondly, is the power of God. It's the power of God we learn in verse 18 because it saves people. It gets into their life and it changes them completely. You know, when Paul got saved, when he was met by Jesus on the road to Damascus, what did he say? To Jesus in response, what will you have me do? What is that but saying, Jesus, you are now Lord of my life. And it happened in a moment. Can you believe that? That just believing that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, that he rose from the dead, that you may have eternal life, that that could so get into your heart that you will say to Jesus, it's all yours. I don't even care about my life before. Everything I do from now on is under your rule and reign. Where are you at with that this morning? Where are you at with the rule and reign of Jesus? The power of God from the word of the cross. You know, Paul's making big claims here. He's saying that contrary to popular belief, the gospel is true wisdom. He's saying that the gospel is true discernment. He's saying that Christ crucified is a bigger sign than you've ever dreamed of. He's saying that Christ crucified is wiser than you could ever conceive. For some of us, the pressure to uh, stay fully Christian wears off at different times of your life. So it might be as a younger person, when you finish high school and you're released into the world of university or work or whatever else there is to do, and suddenly the covering of Christian family, if you've grown up around the church, is not there as much because you're looking to your peers and there's options on the table. And so you start to wonder, oh, well, is Christianity the real, real wisdom? Is the word of the cross, is the gospel enough? You start to wonder, is there other power, are there other, other things to do, other ways to live my life? Or perhaps it's when suffering catches up with you, when tough times come, with death, with discouragement, with depression, with mental health concerns. Or perhaps it's those existential problems that can't be answered simply anymore. The question that I have for you this morning is, do you think the word of the cross is enough for your present circumstance? Is it enough? Or are you looking for something else? Because Paul would say again to us this morning that the word of the cross is the power of God. That is, it's like a seed. A seed is an amazing thing, right? Because a seed on its own is inert. It can't, like, doesn't do anything. I could just put a seed on the ground and it will do nothing. But put it in the ground, give it some water, give it a good temperature, a bit of sunlight. It has the potential to cover the whole world. It is filled with potential. 
And so the gospel is like that. Jesus describes the kingdom of God as being filled with this seed-like potential. And so it's there, but maybe in your mind or in your heart, it's inert at the moment. But let's put a bit of water on it. Let's get it in the ground. Let's put a, add, put, add a bit of heat to it. Let's get a bit of light on it and see what the potential of this word of the cross, being the power of God, will do. I, um, I became a Christian at about 14 years old in country Victoria. And I really thought that I um, understood uh, Christianity um, uh, as I'd grown up in the church and I'd spent a lot of my time, uh, just my dad was a, an Anglican minister, so I'd spent a lot of my time around churches and that kind of thing. I thought I knew what Christianity was about. I'd read the Bible, been to Sunday school, all the business. Yet as I grew up, uh, I realised that I valued what my friends thought about me at school more than what God thought about me at church. And they were really two different worlds. And so by the time I was 11 years old, um, I became an early adopter of YOLO, You Only Live Once. And so I decided, well, gee, Christianity isn't giving me any kudos at school. And that's what I really love, the uh, opinions of others. And so I'm going to reject God and live for that. And so I essentially became a functional atheist for a few years. What that meant was I lived as though God isn't real. I lived as though uh, what Jesus has done and who he is means nothing to me. And adopted the idea that you only live once. I lived for experience. I lived to boast in my own actions and in myself. After some time though, uh, going through early high school, I'd sort of started to do anything pretty much I could get my hands on that would give me a sense of uh, self-worth. And that takes you down a dangerous road at times. And as I went down that dangerous road, I had just an ordinary conversation with an ordinary friend who said, hey, do you want to come to this church uh, youth group? So I I said no, actually, um, (laughs) because I'd been there, done that. And this is a good uh, just advice to those people, uh, those who are asking their friends to come, ask them more than once, because they might say yes the second or third or fourth time. And I was one of those people that said yes the second or third or fourth time. So eventually, anyway, I went along. And I became... uh, Initially, I was sort of looking at Christianity from the outside in. I thought, oh, I know this. It's not for me. It doesn't change my life at all. But then I began to investigate the reality that, well, there's other people there. And they really believe, like this word of the cross, this Christ crucified has changed them. And that's the thing they're living for. That's where they're getting their power for life. I thought, well, that's weird. Because I know what they know, yet I'm not experiencing what they're experiencing. And they had something that just bothered me heaps. And it was joy. Now, I was happy at various times, but my happiness was 100% conditional on my circumstances. That is, how I felt about myself and how I felt about my life was 100% conditional upon my circumstances. But theirs was joy, which was not conditional upon their circumstances, but it came from somewhere else. It was this external power coming in. And that really rocked me. I was like, they have something I don't. They know someone that I don't. I'm there intellectually, but not in my heart. Over nine months or so, this word of the cross began to work its way into my heart. And I remember, I remember realising that this Jesus, who'd done all these things for me, I was on the other side of him. I wasn't with him, I was against him. Now I was part of the foolishness of the world, although I thought I was wise. I thought you only live once was the way to go. But in reality, as this word of the cross came to bear witness to my heart, I realised that I was the one who was foolish. You see, the way that Christianity works and the way that life works ongoingly is you have to go down 
to go up. That is, you need to humble yourself before a holy God if you want to experience His joy in your life. Because if you try and do it yourself, if you try and create your own happiness, it'll fail you. You'll always be chasing it. It'll always slip through your fingers. And I, God made me realize this. And so at some point, in fact, I remember the moment. I remember two options before me. It doesn't work like this for everyone, but it did for me. It was follow your own way or come and follow me. And I could feel it pressing in my heart that this word of the cross was true. And so I believed. And God changed the trajectory of my life. I stumbled over Christ crucified and was saved. This word of the cross being the power of God, you know, for those who are being saved, this word of the cross in the wisdom of God, that the world, though the world did not know God through wisdom, though we think we know everything, but we don't, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. This foolish message of a God who would die on a cross actually saves people. It deals with these great existential questions. It deals with the root human issues. I watched a movie made in 2012, sorry, released in 2012, uh, just recently called Looper. Has anyone seen Looper? Yeah, I kind of recommend it. Um, it's a bit violent, you know, whatever else. But um, anyway, good for sermon illustrations. So <laughs> I did watch it and then realised this afterwards. But And it's... Very challenging to give a brief synopsis um, for time travel movies. So I'm just going to give it a go and I hope that you're with me. So um, Looper sets us up with uh, a man called Joe. And Joe is a hitman for the mob. But he's actually a hitman in like 2044 because in 2074 they've invented time travel. And the only way the mob can sort people out uh, is to send them back in time and Joe will knock them off, basically, by shooting them. And so that's his job. His job is to uh, be a hitman for the mob uh, who are sending people back uh, 30 years into the past so there's no trace of their bodies. Part of uh, becoming a hit, part of taking on this job or becoming a looper uh, is that you sign a contract that at some point... Uh, you will have to close your own loop in that they will send your future self into the past and you will have to shoot them and then you'll be able to live the next 30 years uh, of your life doing whatever you want. You'll finish your contract, you'll get a big payday and then uh, your loop will be closed. So that's how it works. Except the problem is that when, um, when Joe actually finds his older self uh, who comes back in time and he's supposed to close the loop. Uh, he shoots him, but then he goes off and says, has this kind of existential crisis. He realises that uh, you know, he's just been living life for himself forever. Uh, and so he's continuing on this process of just doing whatever he wants. He's a, he's a drug addict. He's a criminal. Uh, he's living uh, his best life every day until... As he gets closer to this 30 years, that, uh, this end date of his life, 25 years in, uh, he falls in love. And he says this woman changed him. This love that he received from an external source changes him. This love somehow got into his heart and made him a new person. As this is happening, um, there's a new power that arises called the Rainmaker. And the rainmaker is in the future is someone who is just causing absolute chaos uh, amongst the world. And so he's really troubled by this. And this rainmaker becomes the mob boss. And this rainmaker uh, sends people in to capture the older Joe. They shoot his wife and they send him back to be executed by his younger self. You can see how it's a bit confusing. Anyway, the movie sort of gets to this end point where um, 
You've got uh, the older Joe who escapes uh, from being shot by his younger self and decides that he needs to kill the baby rainmaker or the the young boy who's the rainmaker. Uh, You've got uh, the younger Joe who's trying to kill the older Joe uh, to save his own life. Uh, You've got the mother of this boy who's the rainmaker who's willing to die for her son. And there's this final scene in the movie where uh, everyone's about to, you know, wanting to kill someone for love or save someone for love, to stand in the way of death. And suddenly the young Joe realises that there's just a cycle, that humanity is in this cycle of death and sin and they can't escape out of it. And so the only way is for him to close the loop and turn the gun on himself, to end his own life in order to save others. And that's exactly what he does. He realises that only by sacrificing himself for the sake of others can he end the ongoing loop of evil in the world. He had to become foolish because his older self was living for himself. But as a younger man, he had to become foolish in the eyes of the world to actually live for the sake of others, to put his own life on the line, to give up his own life to save others. And see, this is what Jesus has done. Jesus entered a world where it's dog eat dog. It's you only live once. It's make the most out of your life for as long as you can. That's pretty much what we're being sold. And Jesus didn't do it. He saw as as God this humanity under the pressure of sin constantly, going through almost this feedback loop of violence, death and destruction. Our selfishness destroying us. And he cut the loop by taking that violence and self-destruction onto himself. Jesus became unwise and foolish for you and me. So we've seen that the word of the cross is folly to a perishing world. We've seen the word of the cross is the power of God to those who are being saved. But I want to finish. I just want to give you four points of application this morning. That the word of the cross makes us consider our calling. The word of the cross makes us consider our calling. Look at verse 26. It says, consider your calling. Think about what it means to be saved. And he gives four things, four ways to think about this. He says, uh, firstly, uh, in verse 30, he says, And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God. Jesus became to us wisdom from God. What does that mean? Well, it means a bit like Paul's own personal experience, that knowing Jesus should be changing everything in your life. And if it's not, you're not going deep enough. Has anyone ever tried to preserve meat before? Yeah, and you need to rub a lot of salt into it to preserve it, right? You need to rub that salt. And I was rubbing some salt into meat yesterday. It was a very therapeutic experience. But it made me think of the way we need to rub the gospel deeper into our lives so that we'll have a preserving effect. So it will do something. If I just left that meat out on the table, no salt, it's just going to rot, right? And if your life is feeling a bit rotten at the moment, it's because you haven't rubbed the salt of the gospel in deep enough. That's the wisdom from God is that the gospel should be changing your life. And if you're not feeling it now, it's because it hasn't gone deep enough. You've got to take hold of this good news and get it into your soul as much as you possibly can. Take God's word and read it as it's true. Take God's word and study it until you can get the marrow out of it. Rub that salt in deep so that it will preserve your life. The second thing that we promise as a point of application for us, it says, and because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness. Jesus became to us righteousness. That is, we, if we believe in Jesus, become right 
with God through faith in his grace. I was meeting with a guy a few years ago who uh, became a Christian in his 60s. And he wasn't quite there yet. He'd met someone at a sporting club who'd witnessed to him and he thought Christianity was a good option, so he had a look into it. And he thought, oh, this, this faith, you know, it's got something to it. And so he began to believe that, well, Christianity makes you a good person, so I should take it on. But then after a while, um, he was you know, striving and, and trying to... Um, you know, be a good person and struggling with it, but he just kept studying the Bible and kept working harder. And so I met up with him um, because he said he wanted to get baptised and so we met for a few months in preparation for baptism. And the thing that we began to study was the grace of God in that you can't make yourself right with God by doing good things because you're not good in and of yourself. Your good works won't cover over your bad deeds. It doesn't work like that. Someone has to do it for you. God has to give you his righteousness vicariously. Jesus has to give his perfect status with the Father to you as a gift. It has to be grace. And as we, we began to study through the Bible, the book of Ephesians, another letter by Paul, as we began to study this, this idea of grace and God's righteousness as a gift got into his heart. And so while he was most of the way, he suddenly dawned at him, oh, I don't need to do anything to be saved. I just need to receive what Jesus has done. I said, yes, now you're ready to be baptised. You can read the Bible two ways. You can read the Bible seeing all the things you need to do to please God and you will never get it. Or you can read it the other way and see all the things that God has done to get you and believe it and you're in. That is the righteousness that comes from God. So I've seen wisdom from God. We've seen righteousness. The third is sanctification. We get that from Jesus. Now, I've, I've pressed on this a little bit, but I want to press a bit deeper. How's the work of Jesus changing you right now? How's your self-worth going. You, know, you, you might mentally say, I believe, but functionally, you might feel inadequate, not enough. You get really prickly when someone criticises you. And so deep down, you're not really believing that you're an adopted son or daughter of the risen king. You feel like your self-worth comes from others. Perhaps you feel the need that you always need to boast about yourself. Or you exaggerate a lot. You're always wondering, what does that person think of me? Or are they talking about me? When your self-worth is in your own performance, you need a boost from someone else and so you boast. You will live for the approval of others. This was my story. Even after I became a Christian, uh, we moved states, we moved to South Australia and I realised that the thing that I desired before I got converted was still sort of hidden in my heart and came out again as I went to a new place and struggled with meeting new friends and fitting in. And so I lived again for the approval of others and I buried my Christian faith. I wouldn't boast in Jesus because I knew that wouldn't get me any acceptance. But I did things in order to get the approval of others in my life. I lived for things that were boastworthy. But it was when, when I was in my final year of high school, a friend of mine died in a car crash and I realised that the foolishness of the cross was enough for me again. Because I was, again, faced with the, real, with the reality that if this Christian friend had died and gone to heaven, and I believed that too, then that really was the most important thing. And so it's amazing a change that happened in my life at that moment because I went from being boasting in myself to accepting that I would look foolish in front of others for being a Christian and sharing my faith openly or boasting in the Lord as the text says. But I only went there, I only realised that because this sanctifying work of God got into my heart again. It changed me. So if you're a person who's a bit 
worried about sharing your faith or a bit worried about being found out as a Christian or you know, mentioning what you did on the weekend is a great way to share your faith, but we often avoid doing it. You need the salt of the gospel to be rubbed into your soul again. You need to realise that Jesus' verdict is the only one that counts. If your self-worth is really about your performance, you need to look back and see, if Jesus has become my righteousness, if the way the Father looks on Jesus is the way the Father looks on me now, then that is enough. And you can speak to your soul and change the way you view yourself as your mind is renewed by the gospel. Let me finish. Last point. The word of the cross makes us consider our calling because it gives us redemption. We need to be set free from our sins. That is the work that Jesus has done. He set us free from our sins. Let me ask you, have you ever tried to overcome your own habitual sins? It's hard. Impossible on your own. You know, the pattern of sin that you keep going back to in pride and self-righteousness and the critical spirit in self-pity and secret addictions. You've probably seen this before, but um, I'll just give you a generic story, but I'm sure you've seen it before. You know, there's a, a woman who um, overcame her addiction to food and was overweight, but uh, became skinny and fit and then became addicted to wellness. And she's got an Instagram page about it. And so the obsession that she had before with a lack of self-worth because of her overeating, she now has an obsession now with her uh, appearance because of her attitude towards wellness. You know, the world says uh, that it's good and she gets all the affirmation she wants from her boasting about herself now, but she's in a worse, she's in a worse state in her heart. Her total self-worth now is tied to maintaining this new fit persona. But the bondage, the slavery to self is exactly the same, if not worse, than it was before. You see, the harder we try through willpower to overcome sin, the less successful we are. Sin is not the things that make you fat or unhealthy, but rather sin is the thing that enslaves your soul. And so to the degree that we see that Jesus became despised and low, we see in verse 28, to the degree that we see that Jesus became the thing that was not for you and that he did it in love, when you get this personally, you are set free by grace because you realise that your Christianity is not your self-help plan to get your life back on track, but it's the story of how God has saved you and made you a new creature in God's sight and that he has set you free from sin. On that note, I'm going to pray and then we're going to have communion. Our Father, we uh, need this truth to be rubbed into our souls. And so we ask by your spirit and in your grace, you would do this for us. And we ask that in Jesus' name.